Man, is it good to be in the house of the Lord tonight? Amen. Amen. Excited to be here. Excited for what God's going to do tonight. I believe God helped us this morning. Amen. Amen. But I tell you what, I'm believing God's got something else in store for this service tonight. Amen. Mark chapter 3 tells us of uh, how Jesus had been preaching and teaching. And all of a sudden, this crowd began to gather around. Uh, because they heard of what God was doing. They heard of the mighty things that were taking place. And, and they got to a point where there were some people that were desperate for a touch of God. They were desperate to see God move. And so what happens is they begin to tear off the roof. And they begin to lower their friend down into a place where he's in the presence of Jesus. And the word of God tells us that as they do, that Jesus says, Thy sins be forgiven thee. And all of a sudden, people begin to talk because they're, they're trying to figure out what's going on. And, and he says, you know what? Because you're struggling to believe that I can do that, arise and walk. And I tell you what, I was reading that just earlier today. And I began to think, Lord, you know what you showed us right there was whether we've got a physical need or whether we've got a spiritual need. It doesn't matter as long as we can get to Jesus. Amen. And can I tell you, you are in the presence of Jesus tonight. So whatever you need to do, whatever you need to tear apart, whatever you need to get out of the way, you need to just do that tonight and say, Lord, let me get to you because if I can get in your presence. I can find all the help that I need. Amen. Can we stand to our feet as we start this service and say, God, help me to get to you and let me see you do what only you can do tonight. God, we thank you, Lord, that you're in the house. We thank you, God, for the spirit of revival. We thank you, Lord, that you can meet every physical, every spiritual need in this house tonight. I pray, stir up the church, Lord, and let us do whatever we've got to do to get to you. Oh, God, we're hungry. We're asking you, come by tonight. Amen. Just worship the Lord tonight. Did you come to worship the Lord tonight? Mm, well, look where he's brought me from. Oh, look where he's brought me from. Oh, he brought me out of darkness into his marvelous light. Look where he brought me from. Oh, look where he brought me from. Oh, look where he brought me from. Oh, Oh, he brought me out of darkness into his marvelous light. Look where he brought me from. Oh, look where he brought me from. Oh, look where he brought me from. Oh, he brought me out of darkness into his marvelous light. Look where he brought me. Oh, you remember where he brought you from? Look where he brought me from. Look where he brought me from. Oh, he brought me out of darkness into his marvelous light. Look where he brought me from. Oh, yes, look where he brought me from. Oh, look where he brought me from. Oh, he brought me out of darkness into his marvelous light. Look where he brought me from. Oh, God is a good God, worthy to be praised. God is a good God, He's worthy to be praised. Oh, God is a good God, He's worthy to be praised. God is a good God, He's worthy to be praised. Oh, yes, God is a mighty God. Oh, yes, God is a mighty God. I said, God is a mighty God. God is a mighty God. Oh, God is an awesome God. Oh, said God is an awesome God. Oh, yes, God is an awesome God. God is an awesome God. Oh, yes, God is a good God. Oh, I said God is a good God. Oh, yes, God is a good God. God is a good God. Oh, yes, 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 God is a good God. Oh
is a good God. I said God is a good God. God is a good God. He's worthy to be. Oh, God is a mighty God. Oh, yes, God is a mighty God. Oh, God is a mighty God. God is a mighty God. Oh, how many of you know we serve a mighty God? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's sing a little bit of old time power. Oh, they were in an upper chamber, and they were all in one accord with the Holy Ghost. As was promised by our Lord Yes, oh Lord, in the power just now Oh Lord, in the power just now Oh Lord, in the power just now To baptize Oh yes, oh Tons of fire came down upon them, just like the Lord said He would send. We're asking, Oh Lord, send the power just now. Oh Lord, send the power just now. Oh Lord, send the power just now. Baptize everyone. Oh yes, this old time power was given. To our fathers who were true, but this is promised to all believers that we all may have it too. We're asking, oh Lord, in the power just now, oh Lord, in the power just now, oh Lord, in the power just now, baptize everyone. Oh, Descended with the sound of rushing wind, tongues of fire came down upon them as the Lord said He would send. We're asking, Oh Lord, in the power just now, Oh Lord, in the power just now, Oh Lord, in the power just now, baptize it. Old time power it was given to our fathers who were true, but this is promised to all believers that we all may have it too. We're asking, oh Lord, in the power just now, oh Lord, in the power just now, oh. I was singing through that song just a little bit earlier that reading that third verse it says this old time power was given to our fathers who were true but it don't stop there it says this is promised to believers and we all may have it too I don't know about you but I came into revival needing a fresh outpouring of the Holy Ghost I came into revival needing a fresh touch of the Spirit of God. I don't want to live off of yesterday's outpouring, but I want to experience the power of God fresh and anew. And I'm telling you, if you want that as well, it's available to you. 
in this revival. Hallelujah. This old time power was given to our fathers who were true. But this is promised to all believers that we all Praise the name of the Lord. Glory to God. I'm rejoicing night and day as I walk the narrow way. For the hand of God in all my life I see. Oh, and the reason of my lips. Yes, the secret all is this. That the comforter abides with me. Oh, he abides. He abides. Hallelujah.
control. Jesus satisfies my soul. Since the comforter abides with me. Oh, yes, he abides. Aren't you thankful he abides tonight? Yeah. Send it on down, send it on down. Lord, let the Holy Ghost come on down. Send it on down, send it on down. on down Lord let the Holy Ghost come on down send it on down send it on down Lord let the Holy Ghost come on down oh Heavenly Father won't you hear our cry let your Holy Spirit fall send down the power let it fall like rain Lift our praises to your name. Send it on down, send it on down. Lord, let the Holy Ghost come on down. Send it on down, send it on down. Lord, let the Holy Ghost come on down. Oh, yes, send it on down, send it on down. Father, won't you hear our call? Let your Holy Spirit fall. Sit down the power, let it fall like rain as we lift our praises to your name. Send it on down, send it on down. Lord, let the Holy Ghost come on down. Send it on down, send it on down. Won't you hear our call? Let your Holy Spirit fall. Sit down your power, let it fall like rain. As we lift our praises to your name. Send it on down, send it on down. Lord, let the Holy Ghost come on down. Send it on down. Do it tonight, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, breathe on me. Breathe on me. Holy Ghost power. Breathe on me. Yesterday's gone. And today I'm in need. Holy Ghost power, breathe on me. Oh, breathe on me. Breathe on me. Holy Ghost power, breathe on me. Yesterday's gone. And today I'm in need. Oh, would you rain on me? 
you breathe on me? Yesterday's gone, and today I'm in need. Holy Ghost power, breathe on me. Oh, lift the hands, sing it one more time. Breathe on me. Way back on Calvary. 
Come on, lift up your voice and give him praise. Lift up your hands. Focus on the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Hallelujah, Lord, we magnify you tonight. We magnify you tonight, Lord. Glory, 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 glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his wonderful works to the children. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me, delivered me from all of my fears. Praise your name. Praise your name. Thank you, choir, for your ministry tonight. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Glory, glory, glory. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Anything is possible in the presence of the Lord. Lives are changed. Burdens are lifted. I remember years ago had an invitation to go with a friend of mine. Always wanted me to go with him to England. So we went with Brother Danny Taylor. A lot of his family was, his history was from there. Just so happened that while we was there that they were celebrating 50 years for Queen Elizabeth and everything around there was painted gold. They had big old rows of seats for a parade they was getting ready for. And all of a sudden, one day, they started cheering. We was just walking down the road. They started cheering. They started having a fit, and here come a carriage that was overlaid with gold. And it was headed to Windsor, and inside that carriage was the queen. You know what the people of England did? They stopped beside the road. Some of them bowed down. Some of them grabbed a hold of their hats pull their hats off. Some fell on their knees. Some hollered and waved, but they all did something. I looked around me in amazement as they, and they are, they're different there. They, they love the queen. Well, we ought to love the king. And when he passes by, you ought to do something. Not everybody's going to shout. Some are going to cry. Some are going to bow. But you ought to have enough time to get off your cell phone and celebrate that the king was passing. You ought to have enough time to quit clipping your nails and filling out your checkbook because the king is passing by this way and they said there's times that they've stopped and royalty has blessed them and met needs that they had, saw different things and asked for them to come because they saw a child that had no shoes and told them, get them babies some shoes right there. Oh, I'm telling you, that's nothing compared to when the king passes by. When he sees your need, he's able I'm telling you, as Bartimaeus, 
He cried out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy. What, what, what's the problem here? Bring him to me. Be a good cheer, Bart. The master's calling you. He went home different that day because the king passed by. But you can go through this revival and leave the same way that you came if you don't take advantage of the moment when the king. Lift your hands one more time. Say, Lord, help me. Help me to take advantage of the king passing by. Help me, Lord, to grab a hold of the opportunity that is before us to take advantage of the moment. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ushers, come. Let's worship the Lord in our giving tonight. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We want to be a blessing to our evangelist, his family. Praise the Lord. We thank God for his goodness and grace, what God is going to do. Father, we thank you for the privilege to be in your house tonight. We thank you, Lord, for the evangelist. and pray, Lord, that you would bless the people as they worship you in giving. Bless the gift and the giver, and we'll give you all the praise and all the glory in the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. Tomorrow night, should the Lord tarry, he may not. I don't know if you're aware of what's going on around us in the world. You, 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 you mark it down in your calendar. God knows exactly what's taking place, and he's in control. And I can tell you this, friend, the trumpet's about to sound. I can't think of a better time to have revival in a day and age when the world is turned upside down. Jesus is coming back. But should he tarry tomorrow night, we're going to be in revival service. Invite somebody. I've invited people to come before, and they said, I was just waiting on you to invite me. Came, got saved. Then the next few weeks, they was moved to a different location. God gloriously helped them. I'm so glad that I was sensitive to the Spirit of the Lord when he said to invite them to the house of the Lord. Pray, be in prayer. Good number here praying before the service. Let's pray and believe God for revival. Invite somebody and let's see what the Lord will do. How many is hungry for the Lord to do great things? When the preacher gets through, he's going to give us opportunity to pull up to the table, get into the altars and let God help you. Do that and let's see what God will do. Come ahead, brother. I am uh, some of the proof of that. Brother Snow invited me, and here I am. Amen. So invite somebody. They may just be waiting on that invitation. And I found out that uh, it's hard to have revival vicariously through anybody else. You know, folks are, are living vicariously a lot of times through their children and uh, through ball players and all kinds of different things, and uh, they seem to enjoy certain things in life even though they're not actually enjoying it themselves. But church is one of those things that folks can tell you about it, and you can smile and be happy for someone else, but you got to be here to get what you need. And uh, I, I've 
I've been for a long time been one of those individuals that understands that I'm going to keep on voting to have church by showing up. And uh, every time I come, I get blessed when I get in His presence. You just, you don't understand. I think that the longer you're around certain things, you, you take them for granted. And, uh, man, you don't understand the difficulty and the precision and the anointing that was on that choir just a little bit ago. That song they sung, there's nothing easy about that. But they, I mean, they did that out of their heart, and it was powerful, and it was beautiful. And yeah, that's right. Every once in a while, you just need to acknowledge those that are working hard to encourage you to worship. Now, I don't know about anybody else in the room. I know what I'm called to do, but I was created to worship. I, I've got a calling on my life, and I love to preach. I know that that's my calling. But, but more than anything else, there's sometimes I come in the room, and I've got to slow down what I was created to do so I can fulfill what I was called to do. I want to be somebody that worships God with all of my heart, my soul, and my mind. And I appreciate everybody that has added to this service by, by all of your, t- your, your talents and your gifts that you have just put forth tonight and given us the opportunity to enjoy all that you have put in it. So we appreciate it so very much. Appreciate uh, Brother Snow and Sister Snow. I, I, I'm going to tell you, where was they hiding her? She even came out on that song. Did you all hear her? My goodness, I mean, the talents and the gifts that this family has is just wonderful, and you all are a blessed church. And we love, I, I'm going to just tell you, from the depths of our heart, uh, there's probably not another pastor and his wife anywhere in this land that Sister Holly and myself love any more than Brother and Sister Snow. We absolutely appreciate them. They have set a standard for loving people and for leadership and for excellence. We appreciate them so very much. Hallelujah. If you want to read with me tonight, I'll be reading from Judges chapter 3. I want to go there in just a moment. Since I've moved to Texas, and again, I, I guess I need to make that clear. I talked to some uh, this morning. Uh, if you stand, it will, it will help me hurry with my preliminaries. I saw some of you guessing. I, since I've moved to Texas, I, I've been here about six weeks now. And probably one of the first things that I noticed that's different here than about Georgia, where we were for the last four and a half years, or, or Ohio, where I'm from, or anywhere else, I'd never noticed this before. I guess it's just the timing of the year. When we got here, it was, it was a downpour. We got here, and it was flooding. And they all started making Noah jokes instantly. You know, I mean, got the right pastor for this, you know. And so we're unloading and getting things into our garage, and and uh, for the next several weeks, it would, it would rain and not rain. Has it been raining a lot around here for you all as well? It seems a little extraordinary from what I'm hearing for Texas. The first couple of weeks, it would rain a little bit overnight, and I would come out. And for those of you that know me, I like a clean vehicle. I would come out, and there would be this, like, mud deposit. Like somebody just sprayed my car with it. And I said, well, what in the world is this? So I went to the uh, car wash and drove through and let them clean it up. And next night, same thing, rained again, come out. And there it was. So I started inquiring. I, I, from, I guess the, the technical term is mineral rain. Texans call it muddy rain from what I've heard so far. At least that's what they call it in Wiley. And, and so... I, what I noticed is that if it was just raining every once in a while, it would leave those deposits. But the more it rained, then it would clear up. And I, I was listening as others were praying, and I've been praying. I was hearing different ones saying, Lord, let it rain, let it, let it rain, let it, let it rain. And I thought, you know, the beginning of that rain, what it does is it just reveals what's in the atmosphere. It takes it a while to settle the things that shouldn't be there. Y'all still all right if he sends the rain? It kind of reveals what we're breathing. What's in the air, what, what is affecting us. But the longer it rains, the clearer it gets. I'm hoping by Tuesday night it's just flooding this house. And everything that's been leaving deposits in your life just gets washed away and becomes pure and clean. And the holiness that we were singing about begins to affect us in this house. 
I believe he's going to do it. How many will agree with me for that? Send the rain. Send the rain. Amen. Reading from Judges. Judges chapter 3. We just want to read a, a few verses here at the beginning and then the very last verse of this chapter. Judges is very familiar for most of us. And I'll get out of the Old Testament at some point this week, but this is what God's laid on my heart. Judges chapter 3, verse 1, if you're there, indicate by shouting, Amen. Amen. The Bible says, Now these are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel by them, even as many of Israel as had not known all the wars of Canaan. Sometimes God will leave somebody in your way that's going to be a constant problem for you. Is going to invade your territory, stay up in your face, do everything they can to make you mad and upset and displace you from what he's promised for you. I feel the anointing right now. It's not by accident that they're there. He leaves them there on purpose. Anybody had problems on purpose? Verse 2, only that the generations of the children of Israel might know to teach them war. Look at somebody and say, learn to fight. Amen. At the least, such as before knew nothing thereof, namely five Lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites and the Sidonians and the Hivites that dwell in Mount Lebanon from Mount Baal Hermon unto the entering in of Hamath. And they were to prove Israel by them to know whether they would hearken unto the commandment of the Lord or commandments rather of the Lord which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. Let's go to the last verse. Now, I'm skipping so much right here. Uh, It begins here to tell us about who these judges are. It talks about Othniel and Ehud. Aren't y'all glad that we have got better baby names? If there's an Othniel here tonight, I apologize. If there's an Ehud, I want to meet your parents. They delivered Israel. Every time there would be a problem, these enemies would come in and, and... And the Lord would raise up a judge and they would help deliver Israel. And it seems like after a deliverance, there'd be a 40-year span of peace. And then they'd come right back and another judge and a 40-year span of peace. So it's been about 80 years and we're going to read verse 31, just one more. Verse 31 says, and after him, after Ehud, was Shamgar, the son of Anath, which slew of the Philistines... 600 men with an ox goad. And he also delivered Israel. 600 men with an ox goad. Not a machine gun. Not a shotgun. Not a six-shooter, not a knife, a stick with a pointy end. Tell me God can't bring deliverance to your life. For those of us that feel ill-prepared and we feel like others have better abilities and qualifications, if God would help me for just a few minutes tonight, I just want you to look at your neighbor and prophetically proclaim to them this title, Use What You Got. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Say it one more time with some prophetic enthusiasm. Use what you got. Hallelujah. Would you raise your hands this way? God, I love you. I thank you for your anointing. I thank you for what you have put in our hand. Hallelujah. God, help us to not take for granted the the, the power and the anointing. God, the weapons of our warfare that are not carnal but that are mighty through God. 
to the pulling down of strongholds. God, I pray that revival would begin as we begin to reclaim some territories in our life that the enemy has tried to lay hold to. God, it doesn't belong to him. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And we are your children and we enjoy the inheritance that you blessed us with. I pray tonight, God, that we would come into the spiritual realm and that you would elevate our minds and our hearts and our thoughts. And as we look up to you with faith, God, I pray that you would arise and let enemies be scattered. Move in this room and let every heart be challenged. I pray that every life would be changed. We'll give you all the glory. As we humbly approach this opportunity, in Jesus' name, and every glad heart shouted amen. Reach over and shake somebody's hand and let them know I brought something tonight. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You ain't got to tell them what size or caliber it is, just... These are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel. Does anybody feel like God has sometimes left something to prove you with? It's been about 80 years. This is about the time that if you and I were in this situation, I guess lifespan has has shrunk a little bit, uh, but... 80 years in, usually if things aren't going great, we begin to question, God, is this, is this your will? Is this really what you want me to do? Is this where you want me to be? I, I wish you'd just go ahead and get real with this preacher tonight. Let's be honest. Most of the time, the moment it gets difficult, God, is this where you want us? Are, are you sure that this is your plan? Uh, we have come to equate the blessing of God with his will. You know I, I know, I know that this is God's plan. God gave me a raise. I, I know this is where I'm supposed to be. I, I, I've got more money or I, I, I won the bid on the house or whatever it may be. But I've come to understand and realize, especially in ministry and in the work of the Lord, that the presence of an enemy or a trial or even a storm doesn't necessarily indicate that you are out of the plan or the will of God. I feel like I need to say that all over again. Is that okay? Because I feel like as long as things are smooth, we, we think, man, we, we are right where God wants us to be. But when he constrains you to get in a boat and sends you into a storm, sometimes we automatically feel like we must have misheard his directions. We get 20 or 30 years into the wilderness and we feel like, man, this is not the way and this is not where we're supposed to be or what God's plan is. But if you look at this, God is letting them know that you say you belong to me and that I'm your God. I'm going to leave some things to let you prove that I'm your God. You bear my name, but does that name really mean anything to you or is this just your father's religion? Do you have salvation for yourself? Do you have a relationship with God that is all your own? I I, I began to read, I love what Matthew Henry's commentary had to say about leaving Israel this enemy to fight with. If it's okay, I'm going to just read you some of his words because they're better than the ones I came up with earlier. He says this, he says, He let them remain for Israel's correction. But also, in an act of God's wisdom, he let them remain for Israel's advantage. Uh, We don't see problems as an advantage, do we? That those who had not known the wars of Canaan might learn war. The art of war is best learned by experience, which is not only which not only acquaints man men with with a martial discipline, but but it also inspires them with a martial disposition. Oh, God help us. We, we have a soft generation. I'm going to get into this in just a moment, but we need to understand again, we are on the battlefield. This is a fight that we're in. There's a reason why every time we try to have revival, there's problems, there's circumstances, there's things that pop up that never happen. There's instances that take place that we don't have to face the rest of the year. It's because we have an adversary that is trying to keep you from realizing what belongs to you, and he wants to keep you a tenant instead of an owner. 
wants to keep you wondering what God has really given you. Now, let me just tell you what the rest he says. It was much for the interest, uh, as much as interest for the Israelites to breed soldiers as it is for the island to breed men that are acquainted with the sea. And therefore, God left the Canaanites among them that by difficulties and hardships they met with encountering them, they might be greater prepared that by running with the footmen they might learn to contend with horses. Israel had to figure out that that, that they were the church. They are much like us. We are the church militia that must learn to fight its way to a triumphant state. Can I say this tonight? You are not triumphant nor are you a victor if you have never been in a fight. You've got to have something to overcome to be an overcomer. You got to make up your mind that whatever it is that's in my way, Paul told Timothy this way. He said that the soldiers of Christ must learn to endure hardness. So, like good soldiers, he leaves us an enemy to fight so that we can know what victory feels like, but even more so, he leaves us an enemy so we know the cost of victory. Oh, God, help us tonight because I feel like there's a lot of us that can enjoy the good things that God has given us. We love that feeling, but the cost of that victory is something we got to understand. It's a price that must be paid. The church of Jesus Christ was never intended to be a bunch of wimpy pushovers that every time that there was a problem, we gave in, we succumb, we surrender. No, God made us men and women of God, and we are to represent the power that he gave us. If greater is he that is within us than he that's in the world, it should not be a secret. It should not be something that nobody knows about. But God help us to rise again to the standard that God has set for the church to live up to and say, I didn't come here just to enjoy the goodies and the benefits that are offered at faith assembly. I'm not just here for the marginal good things that I can enjoy, but I'm here because there's an adversary and my head's on a swivel and I'm making sure that I'm ready for the next attack of the enemy. I'm a fighter. I'm a fighter. I said I'm a fighter with faith. I'm a fighter with faith and I am ready to face whatever the enemy brings my way. All right, I'm going to have to get you on my side. I read something. It's been several... Months ago, I'm going to try to appeal to some of the men, okay? If I can get the men on board, a lot of times the sisters are willing to follow. Sometimes. I I was reading a, a devotion, and it was about turkey hunting, okay? I promise I didn't get this out of field and stream. But, but as I, I started looking at this, some of you may already know this if you're a hunter, but, but our founding fathers actually way back when wanted the national symbol to be the turkey rather than the eagle. Do you all know that? I'm just glad they went with the eagle. <laughs> Might have outlawed eating turkey or something, and boy, from what I hear, eagle don't taste good. As beautiful as they are, eagles are are scavengers. The founding fathers were men that were still taming a wilderness, and and only they knew this. They, They weren't easily impressed, but they were impressed with the turkey. Now, now, if you've ever hunted turkeys, you're you're probably impressed too with who they are. Now, now I know uh, some of you that may not hunt them, and I'm gonna just be honest. Turkey is not my my uh, primary animal that I enjoy hunting, but I've got friends right now that are on their way back to our church because they've been on a turkey hunt in Oklahoma, and I hope they did real good. They are unbelievably fast creatures, capable of running 25 miles per hour and flying speeds up to 55 miles per hour. Do you all know that? They are, they're smart and constantly alert. This is what hunters like to say is that that a deer thinks that every hunter is a stump, but a turkey thinks every tree is a 
as a hunter. They're constantly alert. They're constantly aware. They can be hard to find. They're even harder to kill. And then just to be ornery, turkeys make themselves even harder to clean after they're dead. There's as many as 5,500 feathers on an adult turkey. I'm going to just be honest. When I first started reading these facts, it, it blew my mind. It's the only thing I've seen run like 25 miles an hour and fly at speeds twice that was my wife when there was like a sail at Belker. She's super fast. But I was impressed. I was impressed with these turkeys. But then this is what I read. This is wild turkeys, though. These are untamed turkeys. They say domesticated turkeys are another story. This is what the magazine says, so don't get mad at me, okay? It, this is verbatim. They're idiots. Perhaps the dumbest animal alive. Domesticated turkeys will eat themselves to death unless someone stops them. Still talking about turkeys, right? Domesticated turkeys will eat themselves to death unless someone stops them. If thunder frightens them, they'll often bunch up in the corner of the pen and suffocate each other. This is the same species. This is interesting, isn't it? That, that, that the wild turkey is amazing, but when domesticated, turkeys are so dumb that they, they have to be kept from accidentally killing themselves in a dozen different ways. Now, what, why are you reading this? Because what I want us to understand is that I feel like we as the church world as a whole have become so comfortable and so overly domesticated that we hardly have a connection with the fighting spiritual realm that we are to be a part of. Can I tell you that when we come up here and we're praying, yes, God hears our prayers. Yes, we can be vulnerable. But can I tell you, a lot of times prayer is spiritual warfare. Prayer is a time when you can let the enemy know where his place is and where God has called you to. Can I tell somebody that there's times that I find that the men sometimes, I love that you guys had a, uh, an outing. I wish I could have been a part of it. I love men's retreats. Preached a couple of them several years ago for Wiley. But, but can I tell you, I started looking at this. Words like adventure or exploit or conquest, they don't seem to apply to us anymore. We have become soft. We have become whiny. We have become bored. Can I say that again in church? That sounds like some of the business meetings I've been to. Soft, whiny, and bored. Can I tell somebody that what we need to understand is God did not call us to be individuals that ever turned our back to the enemy. God did not call us as a church to just represent some weak little something that's holding on until he comes back. But I believe that God gave us examples all throughout the Old and New Testament testament alike that says fight the good fight of faith and if there's anything I could do on this Sunday night that might stir you up and make you realize you are more qualified than you think you are to put the devil on the run not just in this sanctuary but in your family, in your marriage on your job, for your children, there's all kinds of things at stake and we need to realize that God has made us uniquely qualified Fight to fight the adversary that is here to seek, to steal, and to destroy, and to kill. God help us to realize we were put here for the fight. Let me switch gears a moment. I'm going to endeavor to tie another subject to this that's relatable. The subject of work. Because nothing of value comes easy. God says, I'm going to give you something. But you got to work for it. How I many have heard this? Easy come. So if it comes easy, it goes easy. Jesus gave us this parable in Matthew chapter 25. It's so, so relatable. Anytime the Bible says the kingdom of heaven is like, you need to perk up your ears and listen a little closer. 
said, for the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. Now, now you and I have read this story. I don't have to read through the whole thing. But what we understand is that he has talents. Those talents equate money, and he delivers them to those that are under his care. He's very wealthy. He is getting ready to take a far journey. He's going to take a journey into a far country. He is leaving his wealth with individuals he feels like he can trust. It is a depiction of Jesus Christ when he left, leaving his work and his children chosen with his disciples and he was letting them know you got to occupy till I come back he has left something with every individual that is in this room you and I know this story so well he gives to one individual five talents he gives to another two and to another one and instantly when we read this story it automatically thinks of a makes us just think of a church split that's about to happen because anytime you start showing favoritism in the church, it feels like everybody around instantly starts doing what I preached about this morning, comparing themselves among themselves. And so I started thinking about this. God begins to entrust these things with these different individuals. Why? Why did he just give one talent to the one talent man and two talents to the two talent man and five to the five talent? Because he knew them. Oh, he knew them. He loved them. But can I tell you, in the end, he's going to judge them. I wish all of us would go ahead and put ourselves in that story and go ahead and just settle, uh, settle with who you are. If you're a five-talent individual, that's fine. Know your worth. If you're a two-talent individual, that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. If you're a one-talent individual, don't be mad at God. God gave you a chance. Can I say that again? Can, oh, there's so many instantly. Why would God just give that individual one? Because he knew him so well. Can I tell everybody in this room, God knows you. And if we're not careful, we'll sit around this room and we'll look at what God's blessing others with and we'll instantly feel like, man, why is it God's always blessing them? And I feel like I'm sitting here right Oh, it's because God knows you. He gave you something to multiply. And what I found out by studying this, the uh, best I can understand, is that a talent equaled about a million dollars. And so this was a wealthy man. Can I tell somebody, I'd be happy if somebody would add to my life a talent. <laughs> Oh, come on. I know to somebody, you may be wealthy here tonight, but to somebody else, you're a pauper. Uh, you may be a rich individual in this church, but in some other churches, you might not be but average. Can I tell somebody that if you feel like you're just one of the millions that has an average talent, raise your hand and say, at least it's a million. Uh, I still, I got, so, I got, know I got something that God gave me. Can I tell you? God has entrusted every individual in this room with something. Why are you preaching this message? Because I believe you what you got is a call to service. There is nobody in this room that is not responsible for what God gave you. You are not responsible for what God gave Brother Snow or what God gave Brother Dathan or what God gave me or the person next to you. But you are responsible for what God gave you. God gave him an opportunity to do very well. Why would God trust you with anything if what you have right now is dormant and buried? Pull out what God gave you and use it. I said use it. Use what God gave you. Use what you got. I don't have what you got, but I got to use what God gave me. I can't bear it. I can't hide it. It's valuable. God did it on purpose. I got to use what God gave me. He's giving him every opportunity to do well. But the end of the story, he comes back and he finds that everybody's done pretty good. Almost everybody. The one with five. We don't know what they were doing. Can I just preach like I preach at home?
Moment of transparency. I'm fatter than I used to be. That's why I usually wear my jacket. Which complicates the problem because I'm hotter than I used to be too. So can I just get real with us tonight? The man with five makes five more. He uses what God gave him and God multiplies it. See, I could wait to the end to tell you this, but can I go ahead and give you some insider trading straight from heaven? When God gives you something and you use it and give it back to him, he multiplies it. Hallelujah. So he does that. I don't know if the guy with two talents is watching him or if he's just industrious as well in his own field and he takes the two talents he has and he uses them as well and now he has multiplied. He has four. The one with five has ten. The one with one is too afraid. I can't use what I have. I don't know if he's embarrassed for the others to see that, well, he only got one. Well, the master didn't think as much of you. He only gave you one. He had opportunity to make one and a half to make two and sometimes God takes one and makes 25. Is there anybody here tonight that started out with one? The Bible says sometimes the math that God gives us doesn't make sense. He says one shall put a thousand to to fly but he said two shall put 10,000. I know that doesn't make sense in the natural but I've come to tell you somebody you need to understand what God gave you. He can multiply it in a moment. Just give it back to God. Use it, use it, use it, use it. I don't have anything brother. Amen brother. I don't sing. I I can't sing on tune. I can't play an instrument. Can you say hallelujah? Did anybody bring one of those? Use what you got. Somebody else over here bring an amen. I wish somebody that said all I brought was an amen and a hallelujah, but I'm going to use it for the glory of the Lord. I can't do anything but put my hands together and clap, but I'm going to do it for the glory of the Lord. I'm going to give what God gave me back to him, and I'm going to let him multiply it. I know, I know it doesn't seem fair. The talent that some people possess. But the problem is, whatever is given to you, it's not yours anyway. You look at some people with a a singing gift and a musical ability. They're over all kinds of people. That's the gift that God gave them. But if they don't use it, I'm going to tell you, I don't believe they'll lose it, brother. I'll tell you what I believe. They'll give an account for what they do with it. Because I've seen a lot of individuals that didn't use it and they still had it. Had every gift, every, but sometimes they used it for the wrong things, for lifting up themselves. I'm trying to get back to my notes, but I feel stuck right here because I feel like there are individuals in this room that's trying to find traction, trying to fit where you belong. Where, where do I, I, I apply to this church? And how do I make a difference? And who am I? And what am I supposed to do? Can I tell you, you don't have any right to sit on what God gave to you. I'm going to say that again. Can I tell you, you're in the kingdom of God and it is not your gift to waste. It's not yours to waste. It is not your gift to waste. So use it for the glory of God. The ultimate title in the kingdom of God is not bishop. It's not preacher. It's not deacon. It's not Sunday school teacher. The greatest title you'll find in the kingdom of God is servant. And when you get your WD diploma, it's going to be because you did well with what God gave to you. To hear him say, well done, you've got to be a good and faithful servant. So use what you got. He gave it to you. i got to hurry. So work your talent. Work your talent. Shamgar could have been an individual out in that field that's there all by himself, sees the adversary there, and instantly says, you know what? If God had... 
Oh, if I'd have had my gun. I'm going to tell you, you ever met that guy that was always going to whip somebody if it had something else? I mean, their stories are always about what they were going to do and what probably would have went down if the scenario was a little different uh, or the, the fish they would have caught if they'd have had a different bait or how big it would have been. <laughs> Oh, come on. Somebody, you know somebody like that. If Shamgar would have been one of those individuals, he'd have said, I don't have uh, any ability to fight this enemy. I don't have a proper weapon. If God would have wanted me to fight this fight, he would have given me a sword. He'd have put a spear in my hand. I love Shamgar, not this guy. That's not who he was. Uh, He may have even been Samson's inspiration to reach over at a dead uh, donkey and rip his jawbone out and just go to work on Philistines. I don't know. uh, But I've just come to ask somebody. You may have come tonight and you look around and you feel ill prepared. But I've come to ask what you got in your hand. What what has God put in your hand? It's easy to focus on your disadvantage so hard uh, that you can't see what you have. Some of you are looking at the enemy so hard uh, that it's hard to know uh, that God gave you what you need. Uh, Sometimes he chooses to work by such unlikely means uh, that it becomes obvious uh, that we have this treasure in earthen vessels uh, that the excellency of the power is of God and it's not of us. Uh, Some of us got to point our victory straight to God because it wasn't my ability. It wasn't my eloquence. uh, It wasn't my weapon. uh, It wasn't because I'm a bad man. uh, It's because God rose something up on the inside of you and me uh, and what he put in my hand was sufficient for the fight. Does it really even matter what you're holding when you're caught off guard without a choice weapon? See, I'm, I'm going to talk to Brother Snow at some point this week because for years I've leaned on the security teams of whatever church I was in. To handle business. And I have been in churches where there was 357s right up underneath the pulpit I was preaching, and I didn't even know. I like that. Don't check under Wiley's. We have different ones that are carrying something. I, I need to know who's carrying what and where they're coming from. What's in your hand? What's, what's really going to go down when, when you're caught off guard anyway? What happens when something shows up, goes thump in the night, and you're not close to your choice weapon? I'm going to just be honest. I know I'm in the state of Texas, but I don't usually carry things in with me to the hotel. I, I'm just not there yet. Maybe another 10 years. I still feel froggy at least five days a week. So I'm just hoping it's on one of those five days. But when something happens in the middle of the night and you don't, you're not close to it. My AR, or my 357, or my 45, or whatever it is that you've got close. How many understands in that moment, whatever's close to you becomes a weapon? I've got too many stories to tell about friends of mine that have been caught off guard in different places they were unaware with and some of the ridiculous things they carried. A big spatula walking through the house ready to knock down any big broccoli that jumps out. A broom handle. And how many understands that in that moment... Anything you grab becomes a weapon. A hammer, a pipe wrench, a walking stick. I've been out in the middle of the field well, there for just a little while. I worked down in South Georgia. And they, they have something in Georgia around the cotton fields and the corn and uh, peanuts. They, they call them scouts, and they send you out, and you look for different types of viruses, and you look out for certain insects and problems. And I, I needed a little extra money when I first got down there. So about four days a week, I started scouting. I did that for a whole season. 
got my paychecks and got out of there. Because I'm going to tell you, walking in high cotton is not what they sing about. Especially in a humid, hot summer when you're about 152 yards out in the middle of the field and all of a sudden you hear rattlesnakes that you can't see. And I'll tell you the day that I decided I was quitting is they sent me to a field I'd never been to before. And a little old lady lived in a house. and I didn't know she lived there. And I certainly didn't know about her two big old German shepherd dogs. And I walk way out beyond her house, and I'm back there just looking for bugs. And she opens up the door and lets both of her dogs out on me. And all I had was a walking stick that I had used in making sure I didn't step on any kind of rattlesnakes. And on that day, I decided that I was quitting because right then, I became Shamgar because I was about to kill two dogs with a walking stick. Thank God he got me out of there. I didn't get sued by no little old ladies. I'm not in, on any milk cartons in Georgia, if you're wondering. But can I tell you, anything in the moment when you feel like your life is being threatened becomes a weapon. Can I just say it this way? If you're the right kind of individual and you're in the bad kind of situation, a pencil or a pen can become a deadly weapon. I read in one place in the Bible that all they use was trumpets and they had pitchers that they broke that had lights on the inside and they put armies to fight. I read in another place that all they did was use their feet to walk around the walls and on the last day they opened up their mouth and they used it to give God praise. I wish somebody would hear what I'm saying. Whatever it is you got, God gave it to you and it is sufficient. Ah, feel this way. Let the enemy know. Uh, but if there ain't nothing uh, between you and me, uh, but uh, opportunity in air. And now it's the air. So let's throw down because uh, I'm tired of you threatening my family. I'm tired of you threatening my church. I'm tired of you telling me that I can't have revival. I'm tired of being sick. I'm tired of praying for somebody that you're telling me it's never going to get better. Use what you got. I'm closing. I really am. I'm coming to the end. I'm not saying that every man in this room has got to have a squint in his eye looking out from underneath the hat. He ain't got to walk into any hardware store carrying a two by four, walking tall. Or I'm not saying anything like that. But I also don't believe that any child of God needs to live their life cowering. Worried about what the enemy's going to do next. Worried about what he's going to say. How he's going to come in. I started looking at this individual Shamgar. And what I wanted to know, was this a last straw situation where he just snapped? He was just done? Because it doesn't seem premeditated. It doesn't seem as if he's carrying a weapon to guard himself. In the days of Shamgar, the highways were so unoccupied by Israelites, nobody traveled safely anymore. That part of the country which lay next to the Philistines was so infested with people that would plunder. The people, they, they could not travel on the roads in, in safety, and they were always in danger of being hurt, robbed. They didn't dwell in unguarded villages. You didn't live just out of town. You, you lived where there was a fence and a gate. Or forced to take shelter in fortified cities. But this man sees the need to provide for his family. And so he's out farming property that God said is his. We started at six tonight, didn't we? Am I preaching too long? He started by just trying to fulfill what God had told him he should do. And so he's out there behind a mule or an ox, and he's plowing. And there's two different places. I started looking at this ox goad, and what we instantly think is just a sharp stick. But there's another interpretation that also says plow share. And so you've got maybe the opportunity that there's a sharp stick, and maybe there's this 
sharp plate or wheel that goes in the ground that tills it up and breaks it up. All of a sudden, here comes the enemy. It's probable that he's following this plow himself while the Philistines are making an inroad upon the country for no other reason than just to ravage it. God puts it in his heart. This is not their land. I wish God would put it in some of your hearts this week. This is not your time. This is not your place. And I am not the person. Can I say that again? This is not your time. This is the day that the Lord has made. I'm about to rejoice and be glad in it in spite of you. This is not your place. You may be the prince in the power of the air, but the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And I am not the person that you are to be messing with today because I was created in the image of God. I look at the impulse of this man, and he's there. I don't know much about him. It's so sudden and it's so strong. He doesn't have a sword. He doesn't have a spear. He doesn't have a friend to execute it with. It's not premeditated, but he takes the instruments that's in his hand, the tools from the plow, and he kills 600 men. Can I say that again? 600 men. I believe there was more than 600 there. I believe 40 or 50 or maybe 100 got tired of fighting this wild man. And they ran back to tell the Philistines, you should have seen this wild crazy guy with a pointed stick. And the way he fought, what are you saying? I'm not giving props to Shamgar. I'm telling you that when you stand up for God, God will stand up for you. One man does not whip 600 in a natural fight, but in a supernatural fight. When God gets in it, one man can whip 600. I've come to tell you, use what you got. I preached all this to tell you this. If you read this story in Judges, we don't hear hardly anything about Othniel, Ehud, or Shamgar. But pretty much anybody that has ever went to Sunday school knows Deborah. And in chapter 4, Deborah and Barak deliver Israel again. Because the enemy is back to fight. And this is what I want to read you, okay? In chapter 4, actually chapter 5 of Judges, listen to Deborah's song, okay? Hear, O ye kings, give ear, O ye princes. I, even I, will sing unto the Lord. I will sing praise to the Lord God of Israel. It almost sounds like she was leading a choir and she was singing, Holy Holy, holy is your name. She says, the mountains melted down before the Lord, even that Sinai from before the Lord God of Israel in the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath. In the days of Jael, the highways were unoccupied and the travelers walked through byways. Why is that important? Because when you stand up for God, you become the next generation's song. You may feel like you just had a temporary victory and the adversary's back again. But can I tell you what gives? Oh, God, help me finish this the way I feel it. Can I tell you what gives this young preacher the strength and the drive and the desire to keep on fighting the enemy? It's because there's somebody before me that I can preach about a man that came here to his father-in-law's old church. And what I'm standing in is the miraculous work of a man that made up his mind. This is what God gave us and I'm going to 
to fight for it. And the reason he was here is he was singing another song about a father-in-law named Brother Johnston. And he said because he had a desire. Can I tell somebody, if you'll stand up for Jesus, he'll stand up for you. And it won't just affect this generation. It will affect the next one and the next one and the next one. And thousands of years later, somebody will stand on a platform and preach about a 6,000-year-old story because it inspires us that all we have is enough. All you have in your hand is enough. Use what you've got. As I close tonight, somebody's coming to this piano. The victories are not going to be won with me standing here preaching. The victories are won when you take what you've got in your hand. And you come humbly. And you present it to God. And you say, God, this is all I have. But you gave it to me. And I'm going to use it. Can I say this one more time without just sounding repetitious? Somebody told me, I think it was Brother Johnson told me, Sister here in the green. What's your last name again? Sister Sprayberry. I've heard Brother Snow stories about Sister Sprayberry said, such and such. Nothing bad. I don't remember if it had been bad. I don't remember it. But then Brother Johnston points her out as she's walking by and she encourages me. She's walking by and he says, that woman has been here since the founding of the church. He said these words. He said, she put up and survived all of us. You reach an age where you don't have the ability to do what you used to. But your faithfulness is what he gives you. And when you give it back to him, he multiplies it. I'm going to ask somebody tonight, did God give you a mouth to pray with? Did he give you hands to raise? I'm going to ask another way, did he give you strength to stand? There will be times in your life, the Bible predicted, and when you have done all, to stand. He says, when that's all you got and that's all I've given you, just stand, therefore. See the works and the salvation, the deliverance, the power. I See, I'm going to just be honest. I, I've got to the point where I don't have any preconceived notions of how God's going to do things in this revival. I used to hope for a crescendo every night where people were running around and I still enjoy those services when God does it. But I'm going to tell you right now, I quit working to produce it. That's not what I'm going to do. If God puts it in you, God puts it in here, it's going to happen. But what I want more than anything in this revival is for individuals to come to this altar and walk away with victory that they didn't know they could have. What I want you to understand is that what God put in your hand right now at this very moment, it is enough. He's calling you into service. Use what you got. This church needs you. This generation needs you. I'm sorry I've preached so long tonight. I'm going to preach this all tomorrow night. I promise. Come back. I hope I haven't preached too long for you to pray. If God's given you something and you know that God's given it to you, just raise a hand. Raise a hand. Raise a hand. Here's what I want us to do. As they begin to play and sing. I'm not going to ask us to bow our heads. I'm going to ask you, would you just bring what God put in your hand and you just come right on up here. I know it may not be physically there, but you bring what God gave you as a gift and you bring it to this altar. And would you come stand around this front and just raise it back to Him? Whether you stand or you kneel, I'm asking, would you just offer it back to God? What are you doing? I'm using what I got. God, you gave me.